Hello, I'm Chris and I'm the Archive Specialist here at Norfolk Heritage Centre on the second floor of the Norfolk and Norwich Millennium Library. Here at the Heritage Centre we hold thousands of printed items to do with the history of Norfolk and Norwich. So things like maps and books obviously and photographs and, and tickets and menus and other printed ephemera. We complement our sister site, Norfolk Record Office, which is in the Archive Centre next to County Hall on Martineau Lane. Norfolk Record Office holds approximately 10 to 12 million original archive items. So things like uh, letters and diaries um, and school registers and logbooks. But as I say, here we hold published or printed items to do with the history of the county. If you have grandparents or older relatives who lived in Norwich in the 60s, 70s, 80s or early 90s, it's possible that they remember when the smell of chocolate filled the city streets, a result of the chocolate factory which stood on what is now the Chantry Place shopping centre, just over that way. Today, we're going to discover more about the history of that factory and the wider history of chocolate making in Norwich, before getting creative and designing our own chocolate wrapper inspired by some of the things you're about to see. When you want to find out something, what do you do? Well, many of us start by doing a quick internet search and by typing in a few simple keywords, Norwich, history, chocolate, I've discovered a few things that people have already written about chocolate making in the city. I've also checked our Norfolk Library catalogue and found a few books that can help us. Apparently, it all started with a chap called Albert Jarman Cayley. Now, he was born in 1829 and came from Windsor. He died in 1895 in Norwich. But in 1853, he established a chemist shop on Windsor High Street. In 1856, he came to Norwich and relocated his business, his chemists, on London Street, where his brother already lived. Now, that's all well and good and gives us something to go on. But what if you want to check the facts for yourself and really bring that story to life by looking at some original primary sources? Well, that's what we're about to do now. If you want to find out where a business was located or the details of who lived at a particular address in the Victorian period, and into the 20th century. Trade directories are a good place to start. And here's a selection of them in the Heritage Centre search room. The only problem is directories for the years I'm looking for, the late 1850s, early 1860s, to see if we can find confirmation that Cayley set up his chemist shop in London Street, aren't here. That's not a problem though, because behind our inquiry desk, we keep a list of all the rest of the directories we hold, which we keep in our stack, our special temperature and humidity controlled behind the scenes store of books, maps, photographs and more. The list tells me that we've got a couple of directories covering the period we're looking for, so all I have to do is fill in one of our request slips. Right, now that's done, we can go in the stack and fetch it. While we're there, I might just have a look and see if I can find anything else that sheds a bit more light on Norwich's chocolate making history. Come on. Right, excellent. So I've managed to find from the store um, Rogers Norwich Directory for 1859 and also Simpson's Norwich Directory for 1864. So hopefully we'll have a flick through these and we'll find um, AJ Cayley located in his chemist shop on London Street. So here we've got the 1859 directory and as you can see under chemists and druggists, nicely in alphabetical order, you've got Cayley Albert J. London Street. And here we have the 1864 directory and as you can see under London Street we've got a number this time 2 Cayley AJ pharmaceutical chemist and soda water manufacturer. So we've got a bit more information this time. Right okay so we've been to the stack I've found a few things and I've set them out here as you can see so now we're just going to look at a few of them and uh, see what we can discover about the history of chocolate making in the city.
Cayley was clearly a good businessman and had an eye for an opportunity because from 1863 he began making soft drinks, mineral and aerated waters, basically fizzy drinks. Initially he manufactured these as a sideline in a back room of his shop on London Street, but as they became more popular he had to expand, and in 1863 he opened new, additional premises on nearby Bedford Street. Here we have an invoice dating from July 1879. Can you see what this particular customer has ordered? Increasing demand meant that in 1880, Cayley moved again. With the help of his son, Edward James Cayley, the firm took over a building in Chapelfield formerly occupied by a cloth weaver, possibly a glove maker. The Chapelfield factory became known as the Fleur de Lis Works. From here, they produced a number of drinks products. When the firm moved to Chapelfield, their water quality greatly improved as it was taken from a very deep well. The water was described as being practically sterile and devoid of organic matter. Here, we have a photo of expansion at the Chapelfield factory a bit later on, in 1899. These advertisements show that Cady's continued to produce a range of drinks into the 20th century. Apparently, A.J. Cady was a kind and considerate employer and prioritised the welfare of his employees. It was this concern for his workers which prompted the firm's decision to begin making chocolate. This was in 1883. Cady realised that making cocoa, hot chocolate, would mean that he could keep workers on through the winter months who would otherwise be laid off due to reduced demand for the mineral waters which were viewed as summer drinks. Three years later, in 1886, Cady's began making chocolate to eat and while Alfred J. Jarman Cady died in 1895, under the control of his only son, Edward James, and two nephews, Frederick and Stuart, the business continued to go from strength to strength into the 20th century, as is clear from these adverts and this article from a 1905 edition of Grocer's Monthly. By 1904, Cayleys were employing 700 people, and their chocolates and Christmas crackers were shipped all over the world. By 1912, the number of employees had risen to 1,200. Here at the Heritage Centre, we have over 200 photograph albums, including this one, which belonged to the Cayley family, and includes photographs documenting life with their friends and family just before the First World War, as well as important events, such as the fire, which destroyed much of the Cayley factory in 1911, and the famous Norwich floods of 1912. Despite setbacks, the firm's success continued. When war broke out in 1914, Cadies played their part by sending thousands of bars of their marching chocolate out to troops. This was part of their rations and known as marcho. In 1920, four new factories were completed at a cost of £500,000, trebling production capacity. By this time, chocolate, particularly Easter eggs, was the most important product. However, Christmas cracker production was also important, with this division providing year-round employment for hundreds of people. Here we can see workers making chocolate in the 1920s, along with a photograph of a scale model of the newly expanded works. While the early 1930s saw Cayley's facing difficulties and making losses, in 1932 John Mackintosh and Sons of Halifax, motivated by the need to increase its own productive capacity, acquired the firm for £138,000. As a result, the Cady's works were significantly expanded, although in the effort to make the firm profitable, hundreds of product lines and several departments were discontinued. Here we can see a photograph around this time, and you can see there the sign J. McIntosh Sons Limited, Cady Branch. This action proved effective. By 1935, the factory at Norwich employed over 1,500 people, and sales grew eightfold between 1933 and 1938. Cayley's knowledge and experience in chocolate manufacture allowed Macintosh to introduce new products. These included Rolos, which first appeared in 1937, and Quality Street. Although Cayley's initially operated under independent management, control was brought under the Macintosh umbrella from 1939. This bound volume of the Cayley magazine is one of many held at the Heritage Centre and shows what life was like for workers at the factory between 1933 and 1936.
In 1942, the Norwich factory at Chapelfield was destroyed by a bombing raid. We can get a sense of the devastation from these photographs, taken by local photographer George Swain. The rebuilding of the factory commenced in 1946 and was finally completed in 1952. After the war, there were substantial changes made to the way the factory operated. New products such as munchies and caramac were introduced and the mineral water business was sold to a local brewer. With the Cadiz brand name having been phased out in the early 60s, in 1969, John McIntosh and Sons, which by 1962 had employed 2,000 people at Norwich, merged with Roundtree to form Roundtree McIntosh. Through the 1970s and 80s, the Norwich factory made up to 40 million Easter eggs a year. Here we can see a photo of workers on the production line, as well as a brochure from that period. By the late 20th century, the Chapelfield site occupied seven acres, but much of the work was now automated, done by machine. Only in centre making and packing were traditional methods still used. While Roundtree Macintosh was acquired by Nestlé of Switzerland in 1988, and continued to employ local people. In 1988, the factory began producing the Yorkie bar. The late 80s and early 90s would see the final flowering of chocolate making in Norwich, with Nestlé closing the Chapelfield factory in 1996. I hope you've enjoyed learning about Norwich's chocolate making heritage and that you've been inspired by some of the things here in the Norfolk Heritage Centre. Right, now we're going to get creative with my colleague Rachel. Hi everyone, so we're going to make our own chocolate bars today um, and they're going to be special chocolate bars that you can actually hide sweets inside. So to make them you're going to need a matchbox, some tin foil, scissors, pens, pencils, colouring pencils, anything you need to decorate, glue or sellotape. Um, I've got lots of different coloured paper and card here, but um, if you don't have coloured paper and card, you can just colour it in with felt pens. And most importantly, you need some sweets to hide inside the box. So, to start with, we're going to take out the middle part of the matchbox. So make sure you empty all the matches out and take out the middle part. We're then going to cover it with our tin foil to make the uh, chocolate part the chocolate part. So once you have your rectangle of tin foil, pop your matchbox um, on top of it and wrap it quite tightly. So you want it to be able to fit back inside the matchbox sleeve. So wrap it quite tightly. So once you've done that, just make sure it fits in there again. There you go, and that's going to be your George Put Your Sweeties In. So the next thing is to decorate the cardboard sleeve. So this is when all your different coloured bits of paper and shiny things come into play. So um, if you think about what sweets usually look like, they're bright colours and they often have gold on them or silver, red, purple, all, lots of different colours. So make it as colourful as you want it to be. So what I'm going to do is wrap mine in gold paper, which will be like the foil, and then I've got some purple card, um, which looks very much like a dairy milk wrapper. So once you've done your wrapper, you can decorate it however you want. So I'm just going to use some of my sparkly bits of card to decorate it, but you could write your name on it or anything you wanted. Once you've added your decoration and you're happy with how your chocolate bar wrapper looks, 
you can hide your sweets in the middle bit and nobody will ever know they're there. And there we go, thanks everyone for joining us for this Heritage Open Days event and we hope to see you very soon.